Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so it's half past four, and we have an awesome, awesome session lined up for you today. Uh, we have. Uh, I'm going to invite our, our our guest speaker, Mr. Unati Mutiba, to um, just Unati. I don't know if you can pop your camera on, and um, can introduce you to the students. How's it? It's good to see you. Um, oh, yes. So it's a real, real pleasure to have you this afternoon. The students are still coming in, so I'm, you know, I apologise for that, but I expect there's there's going to be quite quite a few still coming in. Um, but I'd like to start with with introducing you. Uh, my first thing that I want to say is thank you for making time for us today. Um, we know how busy you are. Um, to the students, uh, Unati Mutiba is a cloud security specialist. He is also a digital transformation specialist with Liquid C2 Technologies, who is a, which is a company who operates up and down the length and breadth of Africa. And they're also our challenge partners in this competition. So this is not the last time you will be seeing Nati. Um, and I have to say to you, uh, his knowledge is deep and it's wide. He's an excellent speaker and got to say one of Johannesburg's finest. So uh, let's welcome him this afternoon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's uh, we can we can get started with the lecture and enjoy. Uh, Unati, what we've done is we've got a Q&A section for students. So when we get to the end of your talk um, and you've got you've got approximately, I'd say, I'm, I'm not sure how long you're planning to talk for, but I, I think the students would like to ask some questions. So um, I will give you a shout out when there's about, uh, if you don't mind, about 10 minutes to go, you know, yep. before we'd wrap towards questions, if you haven't uh, yet finished. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much, Niall. Awesome. And thank you so much for that introduction. That's very kind of you. Um, for those of you who have to hear this all again, my apologies, but uh, my guests here will get the double benefit. So if you can see, I'm currently seated in one of our boardrooms, and I intentionally turned my background off because I wanted to show you um, what our, our CI looks like. So that is essentially Liquid C2, which stands for Liquid Cloud and Cybersecurity. And that other brand of ours is our Cloud Mania business, which essentially is our partner ecosystem. We go to market uh, as Liquid C2, and we also work through partners, as Noel mentioned, across the continent from Cape to Cairo, who assist us in developing, designing, and essentially become extensions of our service offering across the continent. Um, if one thinks about the industry with which we're in, one needs a partner assist ecosystem in order to be successful in deploying services. Um, we understand that uh, we may have limitations more so from a skill perspective, but also just in terms of being able to reach different markets, given the fact that there's different cultures, there's different nuances in the countries in which we operate. So therefore we leverage partners in different countries. We have uh, a presence in Egypt, we have a presence in Nigeria, we have a presence in Ghana, we have a presence in you know most countries in East Africa. So we truly are what we refer to as African intelligence and we live and breathe that um, as our go-to market suggests and as we move with our services across the continent. So as Noel mentioned, uh, my speciality is more so in cybersecurity and digital transformation both from a cloud security and from a physical cyber security. And as I take you through the presentation, you'll get to understand the differences between. But essentially, if I would like you to take one thing from this conversation or this lecture today, is just getting an understanding of the relevance of technology, getting an understanding of what digital transformation means. Um, it's definitely something that's going to reposition the continent. I think as Africa, we have a lot of challenges and being able to leverage technology, leverage cloud platforms securely, I think that's going to put us in a very strong position to compete globally. So if anything, please feel free to ask questions. Please feel free to interrogate some of the statements that I make. If anything is unclear, please feel free to ask. So um, as I mentioned, I'm just going to turn my camera off and then give you the presentation. Two seconds, please. OK, I'm going to start from the beginning. Yeah, sorry, I need to do this again because I didn't share with sound. Sound. Screen. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this concept of digital transformation is something that's become quite popular across the globe. Um, when we engage our clients, both from an enterprise level and what enterprise means in our world is essentially clients that have a thousand plus seats. And what I mean by seats is I mean users or employees within the environment that interact or work on the different platforms or applications in that particular client, all the way up to your startup, which could be one or two individuals, and then your SME to small to medium business, which could be between 10 and 50 employees and or users. So when we talk around digital transformation, you may have heard a lot of different um, words or reference points. You hear things like fourth IR, which refers to the fourth industrial revolution. You hear, hear concepts like machine learning. You hear concepts like AI. You hear concepts like robotics. Essentially, those are all components of digital transformation. And when we talk or refer to digital transformation, we refer to the role that technology plays in transforming how um, our clients better serve the users or their customers, but equally how the customers interact and engage with the technology. If you think of a company, in my opinion, that's digitally transformed well, and it's probably one of my favorites, would be ShopRite. Um, also referred to as ShopRite X. They have an application, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, referred to as Checkers 60. And essentially, Checkers 60 wasn't the first to market, um, but it came up with a very strong value proposition in that it was able to guarantee delivery of services in 60 minutes. And that enhanced their position in the market and gave a better customer experience. Right now, Check Assist, Check Assist 60 sorry, is probably one of the fastest growing um, applications or you know, use cases for retail. But not only that, you're seeing ShopRite really reposition how it's um, perceived in the market and how it serves its clients. Now think about an application that is Check Assist 60, right? And within the context of digital transformation or cloud platforms, someone had an idea to say, look, I want to build this application. I want this application to do X, Y, and Z. Now, if you think about the traditional hosting environment, the traditional service development or product development within a company, in, in my experience, as I mentioned previously, I come from the data center background, and then I morphed into the cloud background and where I sit today within cybersecurity. And all that basically means is over the last 10 years plus, I've seen the change or the evolution of technology. So if we take it back 10 years, a lot of companies needed to do procurement of servers, storage, personnel, and you know ensure that they had space in the data center upon which to you know, host and store their servers. Now, a server is just a computer upon which you can host applications and run business applications in order to do business. Now, traditionally, there was a procure what we refer to as a procurement cycle. So you need to go to the department, you know, raise some quotes, place an order, and then up once that is all done, get personnel both perhaps internally or externally in order to deploy that server, install it, you know, ensure that there is space in the data center to host said server, to host the storage components. And then we started to see that the, the servers had a certain amount of limitation, which basically meant that if you had certain sizing requirement, you could not extend that hosting capability further. So a lot of companies started doing what we refer to as virtualization. And that was a bit of software that lived on the server that tricked it, for better choice of words, to be able to provide that additional functionality, that additional storage capability and, and enhance that functionality of that server. That was the precursor to what we refer to as cloud platforms, because a lot of technology companies around that time said, you know, what if we were able to give people the ability to host on demand? And all that basically means is the ability to procure IT services as and when required. So it negates the need now to go through a whole procurement cycle, have a people dependency, do a change control, which essentially means that if you're installing any new software, any new server, any new platform, it needs to ensure that it aligns to the IT operational um, department. So that period could extend up to three months. Now with a cloud platform, you're able to deploy all the resources from a compute 
an applicate uh, software as a service and a platform as a service on demand. So with a credit card through a very easy sign up, we can already be building out applications, building out services that we can service our clients with. If we contrast that or take that back rather to my previous example around Checker 60, if someone had that idea to build a Checker 60 app today, they could be in a dev environment tomorrow upon which they can be start configuring and writing the code and building out that application, leveraging any one of the cloud platforms. And when I refer to cloud platforms, I refer to the likes of your Microsofts, your Google, your AWS, and they just give you the ability upon which to leverage their investments and that being in massive servers, in massive data centers across the world, which you just need to have good connectivity um, and that basically means internet connectivity to connect to their data centers, to connect to those cloud platforms and leverage their investments in said technology and build out capabilities, build out applications on their technology, on their servers, within their storage um, 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 architecture and be able to consume it, what we refer to as a service. Um, there's a very prominent or easy example when you refer to as software as a service. So essentially think Netflix, think um, Showmax, think you know um, your Gmail. Those are all cloud-based services that we don't know where the data center lives. So we don't know where the actual compute box resides, but all we need to know is that have a username, a password, and then we're able to access said platforms. And that gives us the functionality that we need to you know, utilize said services. So I'm going to play a video just introducing um, Liquid uh, Telecom, and that'll give you some context around who we are and how we came to be. Next. This. Oh, there we go. Our country, our pride. Zanzi, known as the springboard into Africa. From the beaches of Durban to the Table Mountain in Cape Town to our very own Jawsy. This is South Africa, our home. The golden thread of connectivity and tech advancements are helping us overcome the digital divide. Today, learners have access to technology to further their ambitions and realize their dreams of becoming a world famous heart surgeon, or designing a building higher than the Burj Khalifa, or starting a local retailer with branches that go beyond the African borders. Using liquid satellite connectivity, doctors have been able to connect with patients in remote villages. Goods that come into our harbors are transported effortlessly to their correct destinations because of our excellent subsea cable connectivity. A secure financial services sector that adopts technological advancements to provide its customers with the best services. Our data centers have made cloud computing possible for South African businesses and guarantee that their data never leaves the local borders. Liquid's network goes through the vital economic hubs and even remote villages, bringing connectivity to businesses and homes alike. Strategic partnerships between the national and local governments, MNOs and ISPs are helping us contribute to the development of a digitally transformed South Africa. We now have African solutions to African challenges. We are not left behind. Mzansi is liquid. Okay, sorry, let's go to the next slide. Yep, yeah. so just some of the themes I'd like to highlight from that video. We talk around the digital divide. Um, the one thing that we're very passionate about in Liquid is around African techno African intelligence and how we leverage technology and leverage our capabilities in order to drive development and growth within Africa. We talk around our data centers. Our data centers are where the physical infrastructure is hosted and enables us to provide that cloud computing or technological uh, capabilities to our clients, given our investment in said uh, infrastructure and in said facilities. 
We talk around, you know, connectivity, you know, growth, linking the continent. And those are very key concepts because without the connectivity, it underpins the cloud technology. It underpins digital transformation. If we're unable to connect to services, if we're unable to connect to users, then we aren't able to digitally transform, right? So what entails digital transformation? And if I just want to walk you through some of the conversations that we have with our clients um, across the board, as I said, from startup, small to medium business, right up the way to enterprise, it's all around strategy and leadership. You know, we need to set a clear vision and having a strong leadership to drive digital initiatives. What are we trying to achieve leveraging the technology? What are we trying to um, achieve? change or transform utilizing the services that we offer from a technological perspective. And as we move through the presentation, you understand a bit more what I mean. Customer experience. How do we leverage digital tools to enhance customer engagement and satisfaction? Because we do know that if we're able to improve our customer's experience, you know, our client's customer's experience, then we're able to provide a higher level of satisfaction, not only to our clients, but to our clients' clients, right? Operational agility implementing technologies to improve efficiency and agility in operations. That's key. How do we use technology in order to simplify processes? I gave you an example earlier where traditionally we had to procure hardware and that had its own cycle period. The period I mentioned was up to about three months in order to scope the server, procure the server, do a change management control, and then ultimately install it over a weekend or a time where there wasn't a lot of traffic or a lot of um, operational um, activity on that network, but now leveraging cloud computing or digitally transforming that gives us the ability to on demand. The example that I gave that within five minutes, you can be consuming a cloud based platform through your credit card. Workforce uh, workforce enablement, empowering employees through digital tools and training. Going back to my original example around Checker 60, what makes it also quite strong and impactful is its ability to interact with the drivers, its workforce. So now you can track, you can see how far your order is, if it's delayed, if there's any sort of challenges in getting your order to you, and that ultimately enables the workforce to communicate both with the business and also with the clients. And if you look back along this value change, that talks to customer experience, that talks to operational agility, and ultimately drives the ability for both sides, both the customer and the employee to be enabled and both understand and, and, and manage that whole interaction. Digital technology integration. It's all about integrating new technologies with existing systems. The challenge we often face is that a lot of our clients have legacy systems or have legacy ways in which of doing things. All that basically means is that we often refer to them as traditionalists. So they still want to see their servers. They still want to see the light blinking. They still want to know that it resides on their facility in their data center. And with a digital transformation journey or strategy, you often have to do a lot of guidance, a lot of you know consultation to get the client to understand that we're not taking control in order to you know limit their, their, their visibility or to affect the, the role that their staff plays. If anything, we want to enhance a complement. So anyone that was traditionally working in the data center or responsible for that particular piece of technology will often transform into a more um, evolved role and often work with some of the technology solutions we work with. And this is essentially some of the key points we touch on whenever we engage with our clients to get them to understand that this is the journey we often need to take. And ladies and gentlemen, it's often not an easy one. You know, change isn't easy. We know that it's, it's, it's given and it's consistent, but we also need to understand that getting traditionalists to move into the new age, a new world, means they'll have to give up a degree of control. And that's often the challenge um, in some of our engagements. Now, if we look at it, you know, the world has changed. You know, 50% of corporate data is in the cloud. Now, if you look at those two figures, if you look at yesterday, that gives you the example of a corporate network, right? So in that particular image, you can see an office, you can see different employees um, scattered around. More often than not, they would be on-prem. So they would be working within a building in an office and that whole interaction is controlled, right? So, and how that interaction is controlled is that you're only able to access those applications, those services, once you're within the network, right? So what that basically means is that if I at home and working in the traditional sense, 
I wouldn't have access to certain applications, for example, certain confidential documents, certain confidential spreadsheets um, or systems. It's only when I came onto the client network through a Wi-Fi network or through a LAN cable, then I'd be granted access because the, the, the system would recognize that I'm now on-prem, I'm in the facility. And that was designed to safeguard the organization, to ensure that malicious actors weren't able to get into that network because it often meant that if a laptop was stolen or connected to another outside device, it didn't have access to any of those applications or any of the corporate data that was secure within the network. If we look at today, right, we have a lot of cloud first applications. If you look at some of those applications that are listed there, we have Facebook, which is more of the social side. We have Dropbox, we have uh, Google, we have, you know, Internet Explorer, and a lot of the interaction or employee um, work for a lot of employees now are working with software based services. So what I referred to earlier as SaaS, so software as a service. So no longer does that control now live on-prem. The employee is now demanding to be able to access a lot of those systems, to be able to access information on a Wi-Fi network. And if we think about it, you know, in 2020, a lot of this transformation was driven by COVID um, because, you know, we were limited in our movement. We weren't able to go to the office. We weren't able to move around freely. So a lot of companies had to digitally transform under duress. And what that meant was that they now needed to give their employees the ability to access said systems from their houses, from their um remote off-site coffee shop, because that meant that no matter where that employee went, they were able to do work and be productive. And COVID was a very, very much so responsible in spearheading and driving that change. Um, although a very dark and you know not, not the best period, what we saw from an IT perspective is there was a massive ramp up in digital transformation. And there was a massive ramp up in cloud and cybersecurity because organizations now needed that you know, organizations became aware of the fact that now they no longer, no, it was no longer a choice. They had to transform because that meant that they were not going to be productive. So if you think about the way the world is yesterday versus today, go into your coffee shop, you'll see people working, you know, at your Wimpies, at your Mug and Beans, at any location. And that means that they're more productive, in my opinion, than they were yesterday because work can happen at any time. Let's look at the cloud adoption in Africa, right? So some of the primary reasons for adopting cloud computing in Africa is the flexible infrastructure capacity, right? That talks to the servers and the storage that I mentioned earlier. Reduced time to provisioning. As I mentioned earlier, it now can be deployed and systems and um, uh, compute made available on demand. So within five to 10 minutes. Reduction in total cost of ownership. What that basically means is that with a cloud-based platform, you're able to pay for what you use. So if you want to spin up a server or utilize a server for a certain period, you're able to very quickly use that server for an hour, maybe buy that software as a service for a month or two. So your commitment in terms of long term is now reduced because your total cost of ownership to procure or utilize that service has now been significantly reduced. So Using my first example around Checker 60, if you think about the fact that, let's say, for example, it didn't have the growth that it had or the market adoption that it, it, it's currently experiencing, quite quickly, that company could say, you know, we're not seeing the growth, we're not seeing the numbers, we're not seeing the return investment, let's turn off that server. You know, and it doesn't become a conversation around, oh, we, but we've bought it, we've still got five years to pay it off, we've still got, you know, different cost considerations. Quite quickly, you can switch it on and switch it off. Simply put, um, reduce time to market value, as mentioned earlier. So quite quickly, you can now provision services, create new value, develop applications on the fly, um, limited in-house technical and human resources. So as we move through the discussion, you'll see that from a resource perspective, in terms of provisioning and managing said technologies from a cloud computing perspective becomes a lot less onerous because now a lot of that functionality and capabilities outsourced. What that basically means is that if I'm now looking to configure a server on Windows, on the Windows environment, um, I then have to select a bit of parameters, you know, from a compute storage, 
um, and all other different considerations. And that doesn't mean that I have to have that technical capability in my company. I can then work through a partner such as Liquid C2 to be able to provide me with the insight to understand what level of compute I need to configure, what level of storage I need to configure. And then also from a human resources perspective, because those skills don't live in my company, I don't have to manage them. A lot of that is outsourced. Okay. Service value, what that basically means is now you're consuming a service. So the onus now is on the cloud provider to provide you with that additional service backed as to what we refer to as an SLA, which is a service level agreement. It's basically a contract that highlights all the different parameters upon which we want to enter into this agreement. It guarantees um, things like uh, availability. So one of the uh, metrics that we have to prescribe to, or let me rather say most cloud providers, is a 99.9% .9 uptime availability. What that basically means is that in any given time, the only way in which there can be any risk to that business is you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 percent. The reason why it's not 100% is that we have dependencies. You know, we all know that from a from an energy perspective, from a power perspective, we have dependencies from a governmental perspective, and that just means that we have to put in redundancy metrics, right? So what you'll see is with a lot of these cloud providers in their data centers, they have redundancy built into it. So they have massive generators. So if the power goes off, there are trucks that are on standby in garages that are ready to go and on a rotational basis, ensure that that diesel is delivered to that generator to ensure that that service is always running. And the reason why we can't make it 100% is there's nothing that is bulletproof because there's that dependency, as I mentioned, from an energy perspective, but also equally as much, you know, if you haven't built in redundancies for war, for example, you know, that is a point um, or a fraction that could potentially hurt you in the long term. So we can't say 100%, but we get as close to that number as, as, as possible. Flexible payment, as I, mean, as I mentioned, you pay for what you use, simply put on a credit card, you know, simply simple to deploy. You don't have to go through a procurement cycle. Uh, mobility, the ability to, you know, on demand through your mobile, procure services, and also have them served through different devices. Think about tablet, think about laptop, think about um, um, your, 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 your cell phone. So that gives you the degree, the ability, as long as you have an internet connectivity or an internet connection, you're able to connect to said services. More advanced applications and updates. What that basically means is that you're able to now not have to do a lot of the patch management. So a lot of the updates in your application happen automatically and get pushed down given the fact that you've configured and set those parameters, but it just means that there is, if there's any vulnerabilities or any holes in the code or design, a lot of those updates happen automatically as opposed to you having to identify any potential risks. Um, infrastructure deployment automation, as the name suggests, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to deploy the, the, the technology, better security, broader reach of collaboration. So these are some of the factors that drive um, cloud adoption within Africa. And what I've even come to see, a lot of the clients that we've spoken to leverage two, three or four, all of these to say, you know, given the fact that I don't want to have dependencies on the technology, on the resources, on the actual deployment and management of the physical kit, being the servers, the storage, um, and on the people, as I mentioned, I want to outsource that so I can go to market quite quickly. We often say that this is gives you the ability to focus on what's important to you. So as a business, if I'm in the business of providing soft drinks, you know, more often than not, I'm not particularly concerned about the IT considerations thereof. So therefore, my concern is how to safeguard the IP on in, in, in my soft drink. How do I ensure that it meets certain requirements? And all I want to do is be able to deliver a good quality product to my consumers and have someone else to take care of that. So you focus on what your primary reason for existence, and that is being the business aspect, and we'll focus on ensuring that the IT and systems support your go-to-market and enable and assist you to digitally transform. What are some of the five cloud computing security myths, right? So, and, and, and as, I, as I develop further, you'll see what I mean between the cloud computing security and actual security. You know, cloud is always more secure than on-premise capabilities. Um, in the past, cloud computing was perceived as less secure than on-premise 
if you remember what I mentioned earlier around traditionalists, they often felt that they had the best skills and best capabilities in-house and often had this perception that cloud providers, the moment I outsource that capability, that it's going to be less secure than me developing my own capability and controlling that interaction. Um, but what we do know is that most cloud providers invest significantly in security, realizing that their business risk would, sorry, that their business would be at risk about doing so. So if I'm a cloud provider, I'm going to use Microsoft for this example. If I'm providing cloud services to a certain financial services institution, and if I don't have a secure cloud environment that's that's benchmarked against industry standards and the best capabilities, that means that I put my clients at risk. So a lot of cloud security providers, let's use Microsoft, they invest heavily in their security capability in order to provide a high level of security to their clients that opt to take their service off-prem and put it into the cloud. Compliance services guarantee and regulatory compliance. Um, a simple configuration error may render any system non-compliant and it's the user responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. So there's a matrix that I'll show you a bit later in the, the, the presentation, but essentially what that means is that there is a degree of responsibility that the cloud provider has and a degree of responsibility that the user and or organization utilizing that service has. And as I go through what we refer to as the shared responsibility matrix, you will see that. Um, the organization's cloud environment is isolated. This means that security of each user is dependent not only on its own security strategy and that of the CSP, but also on its fellow cloud users. So that basically means that we also need to be mutually understanding of um, everyone utilizing that service within the cloud environment. And I'll develop on that a little bit later. All clouds have the, the same security. Uh, this is why it's important to verify what security measures the cloud provider will be using for your cloud environment before entering into a service agreement. So not all clouds are built equally, to be very honest with you. You know, um, we have Microsoft, as I mentioned, we have Google, we have AWS, we have Alibaba, we have Oracle, you know, we have several different cloud providers and even some smaller companies. And when, when I mean by small, maybe not with the same geographic presence as the ones I mentioned, they may not have the same level of security consideration as the next provider. I'm not going to rate and say one is better than the next, but you have to do some level of investigation, some level of research to understand which one best caters for your applications, which provider best caters for the security that you um, intend to provide. And also you need to wrap that around what I referred to earlier as a service level agreement where you agree the parameters and what needs to be taken into consideration. Vendors take care of cloud security. The misconception that hosting software and data in the cloud is a shortcut to improve security. All, all cloud providers use a shared responsibility model for security, which I will touch on. And that'll give you some insight as to where responsibility stops and starts, both from a user perspective. And when I refer to vendor, that just basically refers to the cloud provider, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, Amazon. So now we're going to touch on the shared responsibility matrix. So within the cloud security, on cloud security, within cloud platforms, you have three models upon which to consume services. So when I talk around infrastructure as a service, I basically talk around the compute capability. So if I'm a client, I want to be able to leverage the cloud providers technology, so their servers, their storage, and all the likes in order for me to host applications on their infrastructure. So I just want the, the, the compute raw capability. Think about your laptop, you know, without the OS, you know, where maybe you're running a, a Microsoft operating system or you're running a Google operating system or a Linux operating system. If you were to procure a laptop from a cloud, within the cloud context, you would just essentially get the laptop with nothing on it. And then the responsibility would be on you to install the operating system, be it the, the Microsoft or Windows 10, and then do all the different configurations to suit your needs, right? So within the infrastructure of the service, where the service provider, that being the cloud provider's responsibility resides in from a security perspective is from the virtualization, the servers, the storage, and the networking. Remember, they're providing you with the physical TIN. Right, you still need to load on the operating system, the middleware, the runtime, the data, the application. Simply put, 
you need to create that interaction that your users can interact with. Going back to the laptop example, if I buy a laptop that has no operating system, it just has you know, a certain performance. Let's say, for example, it's an Intel Core i7. That's the laptop I'm currently using. The onus is now on me to install the operating system and all the different components thereof. But because I'm now taking care of everything above the actual compute capability being the actual physical appliance, I then have the responsibility from a security perspective. So everything up Everything from the virtualization in gray going upwards is the client's responsibility. And that's very important because if I'm going to contract with a, uh, a cloud provider, I need to understand that if I'm taking the infrastructure, the raw compute capability, just the physical tin, the servers, the storage, right, or the virtualization, anything that I put onto that tin, the security is my responsibility. Everything on in order for that tin to function, that's the, the service provider's responsibility, right? So they need to provide security on that physical tin and everything over and above that physical tin, which you install as the user, you need to provide security and cater for that. If we look at platform as a service, platform as a service is essentially pre-configured dev environments, right? All that basically means is that um, a lot of our users or a lot of people that use platform as a service leverage the fact that there's already built in um, pre-dev environments. So all they want to do, there's already an operating system installed, there's a really mid middleware, there's really runtime. They just want to be able to but develop and design applications on that pre-configured platform and then be able to utilize or service their clients from that pre-configured um, dev environment, right? So it's basically where you come in, you, there'd be some code, you just or change that code, and then from there, you develop an application and that application and the data that lives within that platform, you are then responsible for the um, security thereof. Then we look at software as a service, Gmail, um, you know, Outlook, whatever email provider for, for, for ease of reference that you're using, all the security considerations that reside within the service provider. However, I would challenge this shared responsibility matrix and say that there's one level missing, and that being the user credentials. You know, if you leak your username and password, um, that's a security risk on its own. So you need to safeguard um, your username and password. But as it pertains to utilizing that service or consuming that service, again, think Netflix, you know, think Showmax, you know, you're not responsible for, you know, any of your credit card details being leaked or, or the like, other than if you give away your username and password and anyone's able to access that as a result thereof, then you're responsible. But if you're consuming the software as a service, you're just interacting, logging in with a username and password, the, the, the service provider is, is responsible for the security and often the clients, again, challenging it for username and password. So what are the benefits or the considerations from a cloud security perspective? It's centralized, okay? So it's easy to manage it centrally, um, which results in enhancement of traffic analysis and web filtering, um, like cloud compu computing centralized application, cloud security centralized protection. Essentially it gives you the ability now to have a, a more central or singular view on where your, 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 your uh, cloud consumption resides, and in turn, the security parameters upon which. Reduced cost, cloud security results in eliminating the need to invest in a dedicated hardware. Again, it's consumed on demand. It reduces capital expenditure and administrative overheads. Reduced administration helps users let go of any manual security configuration and constant security updates. That basically means that a lot of the updates and the like happen on demand, and therefore you don't need to be as concerned, although you should be consulted as to you know, what's happening within your environment, but a lot of the security administration takes place uh, from the cloud provider and it's managed on your behalf. Um, reliability, um, that basically means it offers the dependability with a right cloud security measure in place that users can safely access their data and applications um, when, when any time. So basically, again, going back to on demand, you have the ability to leverage the cloud provider's capability and their 
expertise in their platform um, and then use that and create that environment where you just consume and use it um, as in when you, you need it. Hold on two seconds, please. Yeah. So what is cloud security versus cybersecurity? Right, there are two different concepts, right? And well, if you look at the left there, it gives you the scope of, it gives you the different key differences and it links out the difference between both the cloud and the cyber security, right? So from a scope of protection, cloud computing environments from cyber attacks. So going back to the original point that I've been driving, if you're consuming a cloud-based platform, depending on the level of service that you're consuming, infrastructure, platform, um, uh, software as a service, that would depend on the, the, the level of protection that it provides from a cloud security perspective, right? From a cyber security perspective, that entails all IT domains. So now that talks to you being able to understand the PCs, the servers, the storage, the network, et cetera, right? Um, so that means that now you have a responsibility from a cyber security to look at it holistically as opposed to cloud security where you're looking at it from a consumption perspective. Right, so those are all the differences, and I'll give you another example. So if I'm consuming a cloud-based platform and I'm not necessarily running my own IT team, um, that would talk to the scope of protection highlighted there. If I'm doing it from a cybersecurity perspective, that means that I may not be leveraging a cloud security platform. I may be doing it on-prem. I may have a team of individuals that um, are tasked with providing the cybersecurity um, aspects related to. Um, security measures and maintenance from a cloud security perspective, it secures data stored in the cloud so that only authorized users can access it. That talks to the um, username, the credentials. So the right people having the username and password having access to the data, the people that you've identified. And all they need to do from an administration perspective is just log in with their username and password. And then from there, um, you know, set forward the security parameters and have access to said information. Um, cybersecurity requires users to take several security measures themselves. So that basically means that you have now, if you're not looking from a cl cloud security perspective, you want to do everything yourself, you are now responsible from start to finish. So more often than not, you'd have cybersecurity teams that would manage your environment and your IT infrastructure. Also important to note that a lot of clients have a hybrid infrastructure. What that basically means is there's components of cloud, cloud consumption, where you're pursue, consuming IT as a service, and on-premise, right? And all that basically means is that if you think about going back to that video, where from a governance and a risk and a compliance perspective, so by law, some information can't leave the country, the borders of a country. So we have different countries in which we operate, where our clients will say to us, I can't consume cloud services from you because that means that my data moves out of the country into a cloud environment. And therefore, from a legislative perspective, the, the, they're gonna, I'm going to be in trouble from an audit perspective if I cannot demonstrate that ID numbers, that you know, passport numbers, anything that's unique to my country and my government lives in the country and does not go to Microsoft Cloud in um, the U.S., it's going to be very difficult for me to justify utilizing a cloud service. Hence, why a lot of companies tend to use components. Sorry, a lot of clients tend to use components of both. So, both, you know, cloud security for certain data that can leave the borders of that country, and from a, from an on-prem perspective, where that data has to live in the country, and they have to demonstrate that it's not sitting in a data center in the U.S. or in London or the like. Security responsibility from a cloud security perspective, we spoke around the shared responsibility model and from a cyber security, the owner of the device. Um, security threats detection, cloud security usually involves artificial intelligence to detect threats automatically. Um, cyber security involves different tools to detect and remove security threats. So the cloud security providers have built up a lot of knowledge over the, the, the years that they've been in service. Um, think Google, you know, Google is one of, is the if not the biggest search engine in the world, and because of that, they've built out a certain capability to preempt, to understand and define user ability or user 
uh, thought processes, and they leverage that to build out these AI systems to detect some of the threats, to mitigate some of the threats automatically, as opposed to having manual intervention. Whereas from a, and, and that's the ability to leverage from a cloud security perspective. Whereas from a cybersecurity perspective, you may have to use different tools to detect and to remove security threats across, you, uh, across your IT infrastructure. So let's touch on some of the basics. I won't spend a lot of time on this. I just want you to get sorry. to sure. Sorry, Nart, to interrupt your dreaded voice in the deep. You've got about 10 minutes left. Oh, 10 minutes. I'm going to have to move to, okay. Yes. Okay, so, so from a terminology perspective, DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks, APT, DOS, UTM, WAF, SLA, MSS, PSS. And I'll share this presentation post. And I encourage you to go and just do some reading and to understand some of these concepts. And that'll get you to better understand um, how they fit in and relate. Um, authentication, you know, that's a process of identifying user identity, botnet, you know, robot or network, data breach as the name results of a hacker successfully break into a system. Domain, a series of computers and associate peripherals, and encryption, and that's coding using to protect information from hackers. So just this is some of the terminology just to get you, you know, familiar with some of the, the, the acronyms. The one thing about being in IT, the terminology and the jargon always changes. So it's good just to have a point of reference every now and then. And then similarly, exploit, malware, phishing, ransomware, spoofing. Um, some of the concepts which I encourage you to read at a later stage. And then spyware, Trojan, virus, VPN, worm. Um, I want to spend some time on this. So what is the motivation for all the different threat actor profiles? Right. These are the, some of the key personas that have these malicious intent. So if we think about a hackivist. He's got a political or social cause. Right. So he's motivated to put forward a certain political or social agenda. If we look at a cyber criminal, they're looking for financial gain. If you look at a malicious insider, that's somebody who may be disgruntled or, you know, whether consciously and or otherwise, maybe putting in USBs, clicking on links and putting the company at risk. If we look at it from an espionage perspective, that's nation state actors where that's more around, you know, how do we gain a competitive advantage over a certain country? And they want to steal sensitive state secrets and proprietary information. Terrorism, as the name suggests, sabotage the computer systems that operate our critical infrastructure and then cyber warfare. So what we're starting to see from a global perspective is that the more connected we become, the more um, different states prior to even going to war will leverage cyber warfare to take out certain power networks, take out um, certain electricity grids, water supplies, etc., in order to put forward a malicious attack before they even invade that country. So these are just some of the threat actor profiles and motivations behind. Um, the impact and the consequence of a cyber event, you know, it's the malicious at attacks of accidental events, and the intention can be physical and non-physical. From a non-physical, you know, confidentiality, information, integrity, and availability, that's the CIA triad, talking to information in that company they may want to take advantage of. From a physical, you know, property damage, bodily injury, and what are the consequences? You know, the loss of income. You know, if a, if a company is taken offline or they're experiencing a ransomware attack, they're losing income. There may be first party costs involved in terms of having to pay clients or users given the SLA they have, third party liability, fines and penalties, extortion demands, negligence in services, and shareholder litigation. So the consequences are far and wide. And we just need to ensure that we understand in any system that we consume, be it from a cloud or from a physical on-prem cybersecurity perspective, what is the risk associated with each? Um, some of the controls, multi-factor authentication, you know, having that two-time OT pin as we have, endpoint detection and response, secure encrypted backups in, in order to be able to restore should your information be deleted or compromised, privilege access management, just ensuring that certain people only have access to certain information, email filtering and web security, patch management, cyber incident response planning and testing, of critical importance, cybersecurity awareness training and phishing testing, um, hardening techniques, logging and monitoring network protections, end of life systems and vendor digital supply chain risk management. So these are just some of the controls that we put in place in order to safeguard our clients' infrastructure. Um, Cybersecurity resiliency, more often than not, a lot of this 
comes to mind in terms of a house. And this is how you need to think when you think about cybersecurity in a physical and a cyber uh, security perspective. You know, from a prevention perspective, what do we put into our housing environments to prevent any intruders coming into our homes? You can see there's garages, there's exterior lights, there's protection signage, there's window locks, there's door locks. From a detection perspective, you know, video cameras, neighborhood watch, monitoring sensors. From a response capability, once there is the threat that has gained access into our homes, how do we again safeguard ourselves, a weapon, you know, a, a, a alarm system, security monitoring and response? And that's just how we contrast the physical aspect with the cybersecurity aspect. This is um, what we recommend from an approach and framework of utmost importance. From a data governance perspective, we do what we refer to as information security management system, which is your governance, your risk, your compliance, your people, your process technology. And then from a framework, you know, any technology we invest in needs to identify, protect, detect, respond and recover, test the, the, the technology, build out situational awareness so the team or the, the members responsible for managing understand the different scenarios, learning and evolving. And we've built our practice to offer security consulting services product solution and professional services, managed security services, and security operation center services. I won't spend much time on that. In closing, I just want to give some examples of AI or African intelligence. So email is still one of the most critical communication channels and still is one of the most primary attack vectors. So those phishing attempts, all those emails that come in encouraging you to click on links, cyber criminals still exploit that. And they're very targeted and socially engineered attacks, given the fact that we're so physically connected and on social media platforms, they still utilize this in order to gain entry through people clicking links and in turn installing malware and the like. Um, one of the companies we work with, a South African company, um, is Synac, and you know, founded in 2004. And it's, it's important just to highlight the capability that resides in the country and the fact that we are providing services across the continent through one of our own South African entities. And essentially, they were a company that was born out of open source software. So think about an application environment or platform as a service. And through that, they were able to develop an email security and archiving, which basically is the um, copy of any mail that's sent to your environment. And they currently provide that to the State Information Technology Agency, which is the overarching arm of IT services for government. And, you know, they provide email security to over 200,000 users across 200 domains. And why I'm highlighting this is I think it's important to also to understand that we have capability in the country, we have skills, and we need to continuously develop said capability and skills in order to um, be a player globally. Um, I won't touch on that. But in closing, us as Liquid, our primary um, our pride and joy is what we refer to as our cybersecurity fusion centers. It's a basically a SOC, which is an outsourced operation center providing cloud security to our uh, uh, various clients. And we have them in South Africa, Zambia, Kenya. We're going live in Egypt, Nigeria, and across the continent. And the thinking behind that is just to be able to build out that outsourced security capability for our clients across the continent, leverage our in-house capability, and really build on our African intelligence. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I thank you for your time. I know I did overrun, overrun, sorry, but I'm happy to share this presentation and any questions that you may have. Bernati. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant presentation. Thank you. Students, can we give them a hand and a round of applause, please? Um, if you didn't love cloud before this, I um, think you're probably starting to love it now. Um, this was awesome. What a great overview of cloud services, challenges, as well as cybersecurity in the cloud. So uh, we do have time for a couple of questions, and Archie. Um, just going to ask you to keep your answers relatively brief if you sure. uh, so we can get through one or two. Um, so my first question well, is coming from um, Otsile Lakabe, and he or she says, cloud might be the future. However, we are no not nearly as scalable as our counterparts in other countries um, or in other continents. Just a week ago, we had a ma major outage on WAX. What are that's the wax cable? What are your thoughts on this with regard to availability, especially with services and customers dependent on cloud solutions? 
And I think it's an interesting question, particularly in terms of South Africa still being a cloud colony, if I can put it that way. Mm. I think it's a great question and a great point. What we've started to see become more relevant to, to, to circumvent or avoid downtime, and, and the point is valid in terms of a lot of clients becoming more dependent on cloud uh, platforms and in turn the connectivity that enables them to connect, is what we refer to as backup as a service. Um, or you know, disaster recovery as a service. So essentially, having redundancy measures put in place. So let's say, for example, you you you, you that that case, that outage that happened. There are ways in which to have an on-prem environment to still be able to service your clients, and that creates that cybersecurity resilience. You need to assume the worst case in all scenarios. As much as cloud computing and any other technology. Um, offers advancement and improvements, equally you need to cater for situations or scenarios where the technology fails, which it will do. So disaster recovery, having other physical sites and locations where you have physical infrastructure, that what we refer to has been replicated. So anything that you've hosted in your cloud environment, you've created a copy back to some physical tin. So in said scenario, you're able to easily ensure that there's business continuity and it's business as usual. Awesome answer, thank you. Um, next question is from Nkolisi Musango, who says, what are the risks of the cloud? Considering the fact that we don't own these data centers, they are all in private hands. What threats does this pose to national security? That's, that's a fantastic question. And, you know, the risk is around the data. You know, we talk around data at rest. We talk around data in, transfer, in, tra in transit. And all that basically means is that all this data is moving around to different cloud platforms. And from a national security perspective, I think a lot of governments around the continent are starting to wake up to the fact that there's a certain level of you know, risk that's associated given geopolitical factors. So if we have a certain disagreement with country X and you know our data somehow needs to transverse their particular country, that may be used against us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and hence why a lot of the cloud providers are now coming in country. So I don't know if you see, you know, one of the biggest search engines. Now they're setting physical uh, infrastructure or, or, or data centers or co-located in South Africa because they want to be able to provide that cloud service as close to possible as source to limit the latency, so not having to go via different cabling or across the globe, essentially, and also talking, talking to that data governance and that data security. So it all lives in South Africa, but you still get the benefit of the service. Thank you. Last question that we've got time for from Katlejo. As you mentioned, the SLA would set security specs that would be required on a contractual basis. Can the SLAs periodically be adjusted considering the dynamic nature of cybersecurity threats. As an example, the breach of CRPC and NEC Exxon breach, how would Liquid have approached a partnership with CRPC to avoid what has occurred? <laughs> the students are, are like, yeah, these questions this are is good. These, these, these questions are fantastic. Yeah. I agree fully, and SLA constantly needs to evolve. Uh, you know, we simply we we conduct something referred to as penetration testing, which essentially is when we test our infrastructure and our systems to ensure that they meet certain standards. And through that, the SLAs and the contracts that we have also need to evolve in line with the the threats that we've identified. Hence, why that's a continuously, it can be a biannual, monthly, or a you know annual. Uh, exercise. But yes, most certainly, um, how we best mitigate, using the example and to answer the question, is that we provide a very lengthy consultative, consultative approach with our clients where it's not take this technology or invest in said technology, and that's the end of the conversation. Through our fusion centers, through our SOC capability, we're constantly learning and evolving, and we have periodic discussions monthly even with our clients where we give them health reports to say we've noticed that this threat is coming or emanating from um location y and they're targeting you know companies or in or planet or government organizations of this nature we suggest we morph or we evolve your cybersecurity fabric to cater for you know a b and c and we often give our clients the opportunity to opt in or opt out and if they opt out often say to them in doing so, you accept the risk, 
we've highlighted it to you, and therefore we can no longer be responsible. But it's an ongoing, continuous discussion. It's ever changing. It's it's a very consultative, lengthy engagement that you know doesn't end at any point. It's it, it's continuous. Thank you for that, Janati. Uh, I have to say that especially a lot of what you've been talking about at the end backs into the next presentation is going to be given by Prof. Elmerie Bierman, and that's on cyber risk mitigation, cyber risk management. So some of these concepts like accepting risk and you you refer to the frameworks and standards, etc. So this afternoon's I think a wonderful learning curve for students. It's intro to tech. Um, I think a lot of technical concepts and considerations as well. Unati, I can't thank you enough. I've, uh, I myself have learned a load, a bucket load of stuff in the last hour. And it was a wonderful presentation. And um, we'll see you in a, a, a week or three in the, in the challenge mentor um, session. So it's goodbye for now. And thanks again to you and Liquid for giving of your time so generously. Thank you. Lovely. And see thank you. you so much for considering me. Thank you. And to the students, um, it's time to leave a session and go and join the next room. Thank you. Cheers. Keep well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.